Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Rugby Canada 2017 Law Implementation Guide webinar with an update here for August. The reason why we are doing this update here uh, now is because World Rugby has come out with some additions to the global law trials that they implemented in the Southern Hemisphere as of January 1st. With Canada's weather and the way our seasons play out, most of the country plays its rugby on a Southern Hemisphere schedule, which is why we adopted the initial global law trials in January. And now with some of the additions, what we're going to do is add some clarity around where those additions to the global law trials will take place across the country and obviously have a discussion here about what some of that is going to look like. So what we're going to do is start with a bit of a recap on what some of those measures and trials were that we implemented as of January. And then we're going to get into obviously what some of the updates are around the tackle, ruck and scrum specifically for those new competitions starting after August 1st. And then we'll get into a bit of a discussion around some clarification with some video to outline what referees should be aware of, as well as coaches and players, obviously, to help promote a positive game of rugby. <clears throat> so we're just going to start, obviously, with this recap here. And our first little bit is to reinforce an issue around player welfare that um, is going to be critical for the game moving forward. I think everyone was on the same page in that regard. So what we're going to do is just really reiterate what World Rugby is looking for. I'm not going to hash all of this out in detail as it was done in a previous webinar, which is going to be available. By the way, this whole webinar will also be made available on Rugby Canada's YouTube page. However, it's good to go back and take a look at what it is that we're really trying to accomplish here. So um, here's obviously World Rugby's press release and we'll get into their definition of what an accidental tackle is. Remembering that a minimum sanction here is a penalty and I know it says maybe sanction again, the World Rugby lingo might not be clear, but anything that touches around the head or the neck or comes over the shoulder could be deemed to be penalizable or should be deemed to be penalizable. Right, and I do want to go back and replay some of the video that we had shown previously, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. <clears throat> right, and what we do, uh, what we'll do is obviously on the replay, just go through a bit of an explainer. So we'll see where the tackle begins below the line of the shoulders and over the course of the follow through comes up over the shoulders to make contact with the head or the neck. It's a dangerous play, accidental, penalty only. Hopefully we're able to move on with tackles lower than that in our games. So reckless tackles, I just want to really reiterate here that it's important for players and coaches and referees to understand that if a player should have known that there was a risk of making contact with the head or the neck area, that um, it's still going to be penalizable as a yellow or red card if that initial point of contact is over the line of the shoulders. So the reason for that is to obviously take intent out of it. We understand that context within the game will dictate that not all dangerous tackles will necessarily fall into this category. However, it's important for players to know that whenever there was an incident that that they should have been aware of the possibility of making contact with the head or the neck that it should be treated as a yellow or a red card depending on what our follow-through looks like and so what we'll do is we'll take a look here <coughs> at the force of the recklessness of the nape of the tackle I suppose so we'll see on the replay here number one black uh, initial point of contact on the ball carrier is above the line of the shoulders around the neck so right away we're in yellow card territory and then the follow, the follow through is with moderate force. And so World Rugby's deem this to be a yellow card in this instance. Okay. So again, that explainer there. <clears throat> and then obviously our red card example here, where we'll see a, a few different angles and it's obviously not to scare anyone into thinking this is what happens on a regular basis, but it's important to note uh, the gravity of this particular tackle and why it's a red card. So first point of contact obviously clearly above the line of the shoulders around the head and the neck and then there's substantial force that's used in the follow-through of the tackle 
to ensure that there's enough there for a red card. So let's just be aware of that as we move forward. <clears throat> Hopefully we haven't seen too many of these over the course of the summer. And that we'll see even fewer dangerous tackles over the course of this fall season across the country. Okay? So I just wanted to really reiterate that it's an important part of what we're doing uh, as, a, as a game globally in terms of trying to eliminate contact around the head and the neck area and it needs to be dealt with harshly. Alright, we're going to move on to what we implemented back in January and again this is just to add clarity for those new competitions that are going to be starting after August 1st and those that are continuing uh, within their competitions that started obviously back in May or April or June or whatever that might have looked like that are going to be going on into the fall. Right. It's a pretty wordy piece here. What I did was uh, World Rugby adopted some, some new lingo uh, that they've implemented in the law book and it's made for a little bit more clarity around what some of these changes were. So I've adopted those into this newer presentation here. So we'll look at our definition for possession. Obviously this happens when a player is carrying the ball or attempting to bring it under control or the team that has the ball in its control, for example, the ball in one half of a scrum or ruck is in that team's possession. <clears throat> Pretty straightforward. Again, there's video examples of all of this. Law 3.6, number of players, so the team. Uncontested scrums as a result of a sending off temporary suspension or injury must be played with eight players side. And the reason why I highlighted the word uncontested there is because there have been instances where I've seen referees call for contested scrums to have eight players each way. Uh, they don't need to at the senior level, right? Junior level, they also don't have to have eight if they are contested scrums. They just have to have the same number in the scrum depending on was there a sending off or a temporary suspension or, or what have you, but we can still have contested scrums. So let's just all remember that uncontested scrums is what we're talking about here. All right, again, if uh, penalty is kicked into touch after time has elapsed either at the end of the first half or at the end of the second half, same applies, uh, the referee will continue to play until the ball next becomes dead, right? And then the only way to end the half or the game is for the ball to be tapped before it's then kicked into touch. All right. Uh, law around advantage, so when there's multiple penalty infringements the same, by the same team, the referee may allow the captain of the non-offending team to choose the most advantageous penalty marks. On a penalty try, we don't have the conversion kick. We just go straight up to halfway uh, to have a restart. What we will not allow is for the team that got scored on to take the restart immediately before the team that scored the penalty try is able to get back and get set. That wouldn't be within the spirit of what the law is trying to promote here. Just trying to save some time with the kick. <clears throat> and then a mark. So this is taking the touch law around the plane of, of the line of the 22 meters in, uh, into what the definition of a mark is. So it's just to make sure that not only does a player have one or both feet or whatever, it doesn't really matter. What, ha what matters the most is where did the player catch the ball? Did it cross the plane of the 22 meter line before uh, they caught it? Or did they bring it into the 22 meter trying to call a mark, in which case, obviously, we should be trying to play on. Our uh, Law 19 definition around touch. Again, it's going to be a bit wordy, but if the ball is past the plane of touch when it's caught, then the catcher is not deemed to have taken the ball into touch. If the ball has not passed the plane of touch when it's caught or picked up and the catcher is deemed to take the ball into touch regardless of whether the ball was in motion or was stationary. And then if a player jumps and knocks the ball back into the playing area or if that player catches the ball and throws it back into the playing area before landing in touch or touch and goal play continues regardless of whether the ball reaches the plane of touch. So again there's a few, quite a few different scenarios around this. Um, the player must first start in the field of play before they can bring the ball back into the field of play. And also, um, if they start outside of the field of play and jump into the field of play, they must touch the ball before it crosses the plane to touch. All of these video examples, again, are readily available on uh, World Rugby's law site and Rugby Canada's YouTube page, and I'll have the links for that momentarily. 
Finally, no graining ground if a player with one or both feet on or behind the 22 meter line picks up the ball, which was outside of the 22, or catches the ball in front of the 22 meter line and kicks it directly into touch from within the 22, then that player has taken the ball back inside the 22, so there's no gaining ground. So we just need to be aware of who brought the ball back uh, into the 22 meter line, into the 22. All right, and then into in goal we go. And if a player with one or both feet on or behind the goal line picks up the ball from within the field of play or catches the ball in front of the goal line, that player is taking possession of the ball in the field of play, which means that if they bring it into in goal, we could have the potential, if they touch down, to have a five meter scrum to the opposition. So this is a really key one, and it, um, and it could potentially be a really key event in a game. And then finally, if a player with one or both feet on or behind the dead ball line picks up or catches a ball that has not reached the dead ball line or touch and goal line, that player is deemed to have made the ball dead, which uh, would eliminate the ability to have a scrum up from where the ball was kicked and rather just the 22, still because the opposition kicked the ball into the angle, if that's how it got into angle. All right, so again, here's our resources. There's the World Rugby press release. And then the links to the video, this document or this presentation will be made into both a PDF and a PowerPoint presentation that will be made available to the general public through their provincial referee societies and provincial unions. Just keep an eye out for that. Okay, now to the meaty part. So we're going to get into um, the global law trials that will be in effect in Canada as of August 1st. So what we'll do is we'll go over what those details are first and have some video examples and then we'll get into where in Canada this is going to be used. <clears throat> so our first point is around the tackler and uh, how obviously the tackler must get up before playing the ball and then can only play from his or her side of the tackle gate. I apologize for the non-gender neutral language that World of uses. Okay, and we'll watch this. So on the replay here, we'll see the blue tackler go to deck, come up, and not come around through their gate again, which is now going to be a penalizable offense. The tackler cannot get up and play the ball from anywhere. It's the same thing here with our Japanese tackler. Not getting up and coming all the way around before then playing the ball. Okay, hopefully that shows us a clear picture of what we're looking for with the tackler. So, our new definition of a ruck. A ruck commences when at least one player is on their feet and over the ball, which is on the ground after there's been a tackle with both a tackled player and a tackler. This will be important and I'll get to that later. At this point the offside line is created. A player on his or her feet may use their hands to pick up the ball as long as this is immediate. As soon as an opposition player arrives no hands can be used. We're going to get into some of the nitty-gritty shortly about what that means in regards to where is the offside line and who can play the ball and when and how. Um, when it comes to actual real-life scenarios that we'll see on the field. For the meantime, here's what uh, World Rugby has as some video. So we'll see that first gold arriver come over top of the ball. There's no actual contest there by Red, but we do see that there's an advantage played for offside as Red did not fully retreat. Again, I'll, what we'll do is I'll have a video later that shows where would that offside line be. Okay, uh, other ruck offenses, a player must not kick the ball out of a ruck. Sanction would be a penalty kick. And the player, uh, in the meantime, obviously can only hook the ball back in a backwards motion, right? So we'll take a look at what does the penalty offense look like? <clears throat> So 
we'll see here on the replay blue, I believe it's number five with their left foot. Strikes at the ball to kick it forward out of the scrum, or out of the ruck, sorry. So that is now a penalty. I think they must try and hook the ball backwards, and here's what it looks like when it's done properly. So we'll see the white counter ruck come, and the white using their feet to hook the ball backwards. <clears throat> okay. And again, there's be a couple more examples coming up shortly. All right, scrum time, law 20.5, throwing the ball into the scrum. There is now no signal from the referee. The scrum must be stable, and there must be no delay once the ball has been presented to the scrum. All right? And then how the scrum half holds the ball. The scrum half must throw the ball in straight. <laughs> We're going back to this again, but is allowed to align his or her shoulder on the middle line of the scrum. So the left shoulder of the scrum half can be along the middle line of the scrum, therefore allowing them to stand shoulder width towards their side of the middle line. Okay, and we'll take a look at World Rugby's video footage here. <clears throat> so we'll see the number nine for gold kind of step towards a little bit their side, and the put in there is pretty straight onto their hunker's foot. Okay. Actually, what I'm going to do is play that one again, just to make sure everyone's clear. No signal from the referee, no tap on the back, no yes, nine, no nothing. Just up to the nine to uh, put it in once it's stable. Okay. Obviously, the sanction for a crooked feed or for not putting the ball into the scrum would be a free kick. And we'll get to what does that look like uh, when it comes to managing the situation moving forward for officials. <clears throat> Uh, also, at the scrum time, striking after the throw-in, once the ball touches the ground in the tunnel, any front row player may use either foot to try to win possession of the ball. One player from the team who put the ball in must strike for the ball. Otherwise, there is a free kick against that putting in team. Right. So, part of the reason why the nine is able to move to their side of the scrum is because they've mandated now that the team putting in the ball has to at least try and strike for it to eliminate uh, teams using force one way or the other to ensure that they're dominating their opposition to win possession of the ball as opposed to hooking for it. So we'll see really good form by the nine in terms of getting the ball in correctly. And blue did not you uh, front row one of the blues blue front row players did not try and hook the ball back. Therefore, we're free kicked by our good friend Kurt Weaver. Okay. Finally, handling in the scrum. So what we'll now do is allow the number eight to pick the ball from the feet of the second rows once the ball gets to the back there. Let's see what that looks like. I think where we'll probably see it more often, and I'll play that one again, but where we'll probably see it more often is in messy scrums when their, um, the scrum is retreating backwards and the eight has to unbind. We're gonna let them dig in there to try and get the ball out before the scrum collapses. <clears throat> okay, so how will these global law trials uh, or their updates be implemented here in Canada? So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a couple of things first. First is where, so as of August 1st, the World Rugby Global Law Trials with all amendments will be implemented in the following competitions. All BC rugby competitions that begin after August 1st, which includes all of their club rugby, uh, from senior all the way down to juniors, and then going into their high school season, if they are participating in any sevens at this time of the year. All U Sports Women's Rugby competitions across Canada that begin after August 1st as well. So this will include um, Western Canadian University uh, teams, university teams. So Lethbridge, Calgary, UVic, UBC. I'm trying to think if there's another one in that conference. Anyways, and then the OUA women, the FRQ women or the RSEQ women as well as the AUS women over in the Atlantic. So anyone participating in U Sports Women's 15s rugby 
will be implementing these global law trials with all of the amendments. Okay, and then any other provincial competition that begins after August 1st. So for instance, again, the RSEQ University Men's Competition in Quebec, the OUA Men's Competition in Ontario, the OCAA Men's Competition in Ontario, the AUS Competition uh, for the Men in the Atlantic, etc., etc. Right. If you have any questions, please refer to your provincial union or provincial referee society or email me. The global law trials around laws 15, 16, and 20 concerning the Tackler, Ruck, and Scrum will not be implemented in any competition that started prior to August 1st. So anything that is club rugby across most of Canada from Alberta through to Newfoundland will be implementing, sorry, be maintaining what they currently have from the January 1st trials that we began implementing up until the end of their season. In Ontario, this goes all the way until, I believe, the end of October with the McCormick Cup and then some other areas, Alberta, I believe, as well as Quebec and uh, the Atlantic provinces will go through to the, about the middle of September. So let's just all be aware of where we are and what laws we're going to be playing under this coming fall. All right. So we're going to get into a bit of a wordy piece here, but World Rugby did confirm a couple of questions that uh, we had as well as um, the Australia Rugby Union were kind enough to share some of the correspondences that they've had. So with the ruck, when it commences, um, there is an offside line which applies to both teams. So in this instance, defenders must line up behind the frontmost player over the ball or on the ground. Uh, we'll, we'll get to, again, what does that look like? And the attackers must line up behind the hindmost foot of their teammates in the ruck. So this situation is more when you have... Uh, support players with the ball carrier who are the first to arrive over the ball and instead of playing the ball right away they stand over the ruck to form or sorry stand over the ball to form the ruck here we now have two offside lines right one for the defensive line and then in the case of a box kick or or um, or uh, plays off the nine there is still that offside line for for the attacking team as well this is uh, probably more critical as well when there is a, if there is a counter ruck that comes after the ruck has already been formed by the supporting players and then next arrivers for the support team have to come through that gate, which is I think why we wanted to emphasize that there's two offside lines. Okay, when the first arriving defender picks up the ball and a ruck forms around them, they may continue to play the ball provided they do not lose possession of the ball. So in this instance, we have a ruck, and players must now retreat to the hindmost foot of their teammates in the ruck. This applies when the jackler or first arriver for the defense wants to go and try and steal the ball. Their first movement has to be onto the ball. Um, usually this happens in a split second, and we will see some video of this, where as soon as their hands are on the ball, a first arriver tries to come and clear them off. That player, who ha defender, who has their hands on the ball does not have to release but instead can maintain possession of the ball as they try and either continue to, to, to hold on to the ball and, and win possession, get cleared off the ball, in which case we might play on, or kind of get cleared off, but it's a poor clean out, and they probably earn the rights to the turnover, and the referee awards the penalty for the player on the ground holding on the ball. So again, we'll take a look at what some of that looks like. And then lastly, when a first arriver from either team picks up the ball immediately, Without a ruck being formed, there is no offside line. So we can still have <laughs> the tackle only situation exist when either team simply picks up the ball in a pick and go scenario with that first arriver only. Okay, and again, we'll take a look at what does that look like. <clears throat> Here we go. So some video, I wanted to start with the scrum management just because there's not a whole lot around it with the referee um, not offering um, a signal for the player or the scrum half to put the ball in. It's just a matter of how can we ensure we get some of this timing right. So what we'll do here is take a look at this video real quick. It'll play twice, the scrum will play twice, and I wanted us to get a sense of uh, what does it look like when it's when the nine doesn't put the ball in, is it stable, is it not stable. So we see the referee here reset. So what we'll do is we'll freeze frame it and 
what I would like to see is at this point here, the nine has reached down. They're in a position where the scrum is stable enough for the ball to be presented. Once the nine goes down in that position, the expectation is the ball goes in. My take on this particular situation, especially at this point in the game when we've had a few scrums, would be that the scrum half be free kicked for not putting the ball into the scrum. Okay, So I wouldn't mind um, us looking at that. And if anyone has any questions, obviously throw them down in our little text box. <coughs> What we don't want to get to at scrum time is the hit and chase situation. We do want stability, in which case if the referee was not happy with the stability, I would have expected them to ref to, to blow it up a lot sooner. Right? If they blow it up sooner, ensure that this, the players understand stability, then we can hopefully get the ball in just that little bit quicker. Right? But the expectation from the nine here is that as soon as they come down to present the ball in the scrum, that it does go in the scrum. Again, we can discuss that further with some questions. Okay, here's a little image of where does the offside line sit when we have no defenders in the ruck. So at this point, we'll see that the frontmost player for black on the ground is where that offside line is for white, and then black obviously is at their hindmost foot of that last player on their feet. Okay. Again, I wouldn't mind showing that one again, just so that there's clarity amongst everyone. I may have put the line on the shadow there, but you'll see white clearly on side, clearly behind that player on the ground. Okay, here's a situation where there is no offside in what we would think is a ruck. And the reason why is because there was never a tackle completed to start with. So this player was never brought to ground. Black number five was never brought to ground by a white player. Therefore, there's no tackle, which means that there is no ruck now. So if we go back to the definition of when is a ruck formed, the ruck is formed when there is a player over the ball from either team after there's been a tackle. And we saw in parentheses, tackled player, tackler. In this situation, we have neither a tackled player nor a tackler, therefore no tackle situation. So players standing over the ball have not formed a ruck. So I want us to take a look at this one once more as well. So no tackle, as we don't have a tackler, no one was brought to ground and held, and no one is a tackler as they did not end up on the ground either. Okay. By the way, the tackle assist can constitute um, having a, a tackle situation where we can have that one player over in the forming of a ruck. So let's just be aware of that one as well. And hopefully we'll see some of those in these examples. So with these off, off sidelines, there's a couple of things that we might see teams try and do. The first is to, to jackal, which we'll take a look at an example of in a minute. But the other thing they might do is, in a situation where they have numbers on a, on a, in a tackle situation, is to use that counter ruck. And we'll see here the black number nine never retreat behind their teammate's hind foot before going in to play the ball. Correct call by the referee here, as they did not have rights to the ball. I talk a lot about have you earned the space and earned the right for the ball. Here, white has done everything to dominate. And we'll see the next white arriver come in, come in plenty of time to be able to play that ball if nine black is not there. If they had retreated all the way back behind their hind foot. So, something to be aware of. A couple more examples. <clears throat> so in this particular game, by the way, this was the uh, England-New Zealand U20 Championship Final from this year where they did implement all of these trials. This was a good example of number 13 white. So as a tackle assist must release and come around through the gate and cannot kick the ball through the ruck, even if you're facing the wrong way, right? The goal here is that in a positive counter ruck motion, right? You would be hooking the ball backwards towards your own team, not killing the play. 
Here's an example of where we have the first ar defensive arriver with their hands on the ball and a ruck forming around them. So we'll see 13 white straight for the ball, nothing wrong with that. Once the two black support players engage white number 13, there is a ruck with offside lines. Okay, so just to get us that picture here, white needing to retreat, which they do, and black on attack behind their hind foot. Here's where our pinchers or jacklers can, can be quite tricky, and uh, referees need to be vigilant on whether or not the jackal is legal. So by legal, I mean that the hands must go straight to the ball. In this case, we see black river off his feet with his hands on the ground before playing the ball. Sanction here should be a penalty kick instead of a turnover. Right, these happen in a split second. However, these are this is what we're going to see now in the game. It's either the jackal or the counter wreck. It's good for us all to be on the same page with what we're looking for. And here's what a good turnover looks like. So we'll see here 13 black. Ty goes to the defender, right, who's allowed to play the ball through the forming of the ruck here by the white support player, I believe it's 12. So I do want to play that one again as it happens quite quickly. It's a correct decision here by the official to allow this turnover to happen. So black number 13 survives the clean out, is there just before the first arriver comes, hands on the ball, give them the benefit of the doubt, and then they play the ball backwards. So instead of awarding a penalty, we're able to play on. It's good decision making. So that's it. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to fire them below, and we will answer a few of them now. Um, and in the meantime, if you have a question you want me to address afterwards, or that comes to mind afterwards, here is my email address. I want to thank everyone once again for joining us tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll see you for our French version on Wednesday. Thanks again.